And welcome to the CNBC TV 18 special. I'm Shireen Bhan. And on the GST centimeter, joining me now is the IT Minister of Tamil Nadu, Mr. Tyagarajan. Uh, he promised me about a couple of days ago that we would sit down and have a conversation about the controversy around the GST at 28% on online gaming. Remember, the matter has now reached the Prime Minister's office with venture capitalists, online gaming companies writing to the government and telling the GST Council to review you that decision. Mr. Tyagarajan, many thanks for joining us here on CNBC TV 18. It is good to have you here and thank you very much for sticking with your commitment. So let me start by asking you, did you anticipate this backlash as far as this 28% GST is concerned on full value? Because the rate in itself was never in doubt. Uh, even through the deliberations of the two GOMs, 28% was expected to be finalized as the rate and industry had come to accept that. But it is 28% on what which is causing the consternation? Yeah, well, first let me thank you for the opportunity and for giving me this platform to give a bit of explanation. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't comment about this because I'm no longer on the GST Council. But when the reports were submitted, both the reports of the GOM, I was a member of the GOM in both instances, so therefore I feel like it's worth having this clarification. Mm -hmm. So 28% was never the question, right? The question basically revolved around four or five things. One, what is the law? The constitutional amendment for GST says that betting and gambling will come under GST. Then the question is, what is betting and gambling? Or is there a distinction between games of skill versus yeah. games of chance? That's the second issue. Third issue when things like lottery tickets are already being taxed at 28% on the face value, will it be a contradiction that some games of chance, assuming that we agree yeah. that some of these things are games of chance, for example, there, there are Supreme Court judgments mm. calling horse racing a game of skill and not a chance, mm. or rummy a game of skill. So it's just like contradictory judgments all over the place. So if you open up this can of worms that you'll now do anything less than the face value, some people were concerned with that now uh, put the, the lottery tickets back on the table. Mm. And last of all is how do you know what is the gross gaming revenue mm. or what is the actual platform fee or access fee? Is it self-reported? Can it be done by accounting? Can it be done by having separate accounts like an escrow account for betting and a mm. separate account for own, you know, or the, or the fee component? So this was the complexity of it. And of course, in places like casinos, where people don't just play one game, they play multiple games. You know, unless you do an entry-exit yeah. uh, kind of check, you really can't tell what has happened. In fact, the industry likes to bundle things in such mm. a way mm. that you cannot quite tell what are the odds of winning or losing compared to the platform fee. So this was a complexity always. I don't mm. think anybody had a problem with the notion that the highest rate of GST should be applied to gambling. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? <clears throat> Absolutely. We, we apply high rates to alcohol, we, we apply high rates to petroleum. It makes no you know, uh, contradiction that we should high, mm. apply high rates to gambling. Question is on what and how do we stay on the one hand within the amendment of GST, on the other hand with legal precedent mm. and also not upset the revenue streams that some states are already making from lotteries. Right. Now, as far as the 28% is concerned, as you pointed out, there was no discussion or even debate on whether it should be 28%. The decision was that it should be 28%. The yeah. question was, what should the 28% levy be? On the other issue, whether something should be taxed as a game of skill or a game of chance, again, the council was of the clear opinion, and that is the decision that's been taken forward, that that distinction will not be made between game of skill and game of chance. Now, industry's point of view, and this is the online gaming industry's point of view, and even within the online gaming industry's point of view, it's the real money games that are impacted by this decision. They're saying we'll be out of business if it were to be 28% on full value or uh, face value. Now, what do you make of that, Claire? Well, I think we need to dig a little deeper into this, right? I mean, first of all, this question of game of skill or game of chance is not a trivial question because the GST amendment says that betting and gambling shall come under GST. Mm. It, it doesn't say if it's a question of skill, it's not clear what it comes under. Either the constitutional amendment was not written in congruence with the Supreme Court judgments or the judgments are not in Congress. Vice versa. So which is why now the amendment will be moved to bring online gaming under Correct. it. So, yeah. so the, therefore, all these precedents of the, and you know, in a normal country, you would see that the court judgments follow precedent, right? Mm. Either one precedent holds and everybody sticks to it. Or they write a new president and it breaks all the other judgments. Mm. But in this GOM, that was not the case. Every week we were getting some new 
information about some other judgment, some going back to the 70s, some as recently as 2015, saying, you know, and then some of them were crucial to the case, meaning mm. the case was, is it a game of skill or chance? Mm. Some were over dicta in the judgment on some other matter that was being adjudicated, mm. And in the process, the Supreme Court said something. So the now, GUM wasn't dragging its feet. You were saying well, that was this was just a very huge, complex well, issue. Yeah, well, if I'm very with, honest. With vested interests involved? Yeah. Because there are states that are dependent significantly on the revenue that comes in from this. Well, let's be really honest. I think, could it have been done faster? Yes. But with all other things in GST, that's true, right? The personnel, sometimes when like people change in the, in, in, in the roles or governments mm. change, uh, the reconstitution of the GMs doesn't happen that quickly. Yeah. The renomination of the chairperson don't happen quickly. For example, when this GM was first set, it was not Conrad Sangma who was either a member or the convener. Mm. And then, you know, the, the, the Gujarat chief minister changed and then, you know, we had some changes and all. So, could, could the GST and GOM function much more efficiently and kind of on a time, mm. time bound scale? Absolutely. On the other hand, was there great complexity here? Absolutely. Of course, there were, I, I'm not even sure I would call them vested interests. It's a natural interest of, let's say, the minister of Fair Goa point. that he Fair wants point. to protect his industry. It's a natural interest of the minister of West Bengal that she does not want the notion of 28% on face value to be disrupted mm. because the state of West Bengal makes thousands of crores of revenue out of the lottery, sale of lottery tickets. Yeah. In fact, I'll go one, one step more profound than that. At some level, I suggested nobody was a taker that really... Horse racing, online gambling, and casino should be separated into three different discussions. Mm. I'll tell you why. Mm. Horse racing is a sport where there is a clear tote, and mm. you can see what is coming in and going out, and everything is published and taken out, and there's no question of bundling. Mm. I mean, there are some uh, multi-level bets like the trifecta and all that, yeah. but it's very clear what ticket you bought and what you took out. Casinos are not that clear. Mm. But then both horse racing and casinos have one thing in common. Mm. There is a locus... You cannot run horse racing, uh, you know, without a physical location. Mm. So it is located in one state. And right. in fact, it's regulated by states. Mm. So one of the radical suggestions I had, why should horse racing and casinos be under GST at all? Mm. Make them like alcohol or petroleum or other things that are only at a state level. Because the legislation is state legislation. Mm. It's, not, it's not union government legislation. The online gaming is a different thing because it can be done anywhere, anytime yeah. across the country and there's no distinction of state borders. Mm. There's no locus. Or, or even right? country borders. Exactly, exactly. But horse racing and casinos, much simpler solution is to say you mm. regulate it as a state, just like lottery is regulated as a state, you tax it as a state and get on with it and then we'll have some... But there were no was, takers. No, nobody was that <laughs> radical, right, shall we say. So now we're left with this question of if you're going to take it at 28%, what should you take it on? And I would say... Everybody spoke their state's revenue and interest. And the real question here is not that the industry will die. The real question is, will it move into the mm. leather world? Will mm. it move underground? Mm. So do you which want is, to Which is also part of the, the, the concern and claim that industry has put forward, Absolutely. including to the Prime well, Minister's that, that office. That was always the case. The all, always the question was, how do you incentivize people to stay in the sunlight? Mm as opposed to go to the underground market mm. where you can't track what's happening. Mm. And in that sense, as I, as I said earlier to you privately, this notion that came up in Chandigarh that we will levy 28% on online gaming and horse racing and only relocate it for casinos was an absurd notion because the least substitutable, the least secretly actable sport is a casino, right? The whole point of big Because you're walking, the, yeah, exactly. You, you want the music, you want the flash, you want the food, you want the entertainment. So that, if that is the least risk of being substituted. The question mm. is, will people pay 28% and go to a casino? In my view, probably. I don't think it's the death. All of this, I'm not sure, is the death of any industry. Mm. Right? I mm. think it's the difference between, it's just like the Laffer curve. Right? Mm. You make the system reasonable and a lot of people operate on the system mm. and you get lots of revenue. Mm. You make the system unreasonable mm. and much of it goes into the untraceable market. Hmm. So do you think so, what is being proposed now is unreasonable? I would. I have proposed multiple solutions. I, I think I've talked to you before. Hmm. So the, when the most radical solution of leave this to the states except online gaming was found no takers, I suggested two other ways. I said, nobody goes to bet expecting to lose, right? I mean, it's human nature. I'm yep. going to bet expecting yep. to win. Right. The real question is, if I'm going to pay 128 instead of 1, and win two rupees. 
then it's a completely different bet than if I pay one and two rupees. Right? Yeah. That's the whole point yeah. of whether you tax it 28. And let's say you're able to say that 20% is the platform fee and you only pay 28% GST on 20% yeah. of the total. Yeah. Then you're placing a one rupee 5.6 paise bet yeah. on a two rupee bet. There's a profoundly different, different. odds yeah. in, the, in the minds Mind. of the, yeah. uh, uh, the punter, the, yeah. the better. So all I said was for things like lottery, there's no question of whether GST changes behavior or not because they're not winning, expecting to win 10 is to 1. Mm. They're not expecting to win 100 is to 1. They're expecting to buy a, a 1 rupee ticket and buy win 1 lakh. Mm. He doesn't care whether he paid 1 rupee or 1 rupee yeah. 28 paise to yeah. win 1 lakh. Yeah. But if you go to games of you know odds of 1 is to 3, 2 is to 5, those kinds of odds, it makes a big difference because 28% mm. skews the odds. Mm. So there are multiple ways to deal with that. And one of them I said was to basically say that if your winnings are less than X ratio, hmm. you will get the re refund of the GST, hmm. right? As long as you keep proper yeah. track, you like yeah. to keep electronic track. Yeah. And if it's more than 10X, let's say, you don't get the rebate. Hmm. That would actually maximize revenues, hmm. incentivize betters, and not really be a drain of any real you know, loss on GST because hmm. you're only giving him back GST on one rupee, right? Hmm. And you can direct tax, you can income tax mm. the 5 rupee or 10 rupee gain mm. because it's all computerized now yeah. and those should be taxed as winnings in mm. income. If you can't do that and that was considered too complicated, we don't want to get mm. into that. Then with the help of the committee that you know we had set up in Tamil Nadu, I had requested Arvind Datta, the, the senior, senior Supreme Court lawyer and he heads a committee for us when I was finance minister mm. called the uh, Committee on Federal Fiscal Relations right. and they are specialists. So they suggested something which I also proposed. They said at the point of revenue booking, book the revenue into two different streams. Mm. One stream is whatever you consider to be your gross gaming revenue, your platform fee, your access fee, whatever you want mm. to call it. Only that will be subject to GST. GST. The rest you put in an escrow account for mm. only winnings. And that money will be only subject to TDS and reporting for taxation. Right. Right. This way you keep clean accounts. Mm. And now you're no longer f uh, uh, applying 28% on the full value. Mm. You're applying 28% on whatever the system says is the, is the platform revenue. fee, the access fee, the gross gaming revenue. Yeah. But what that requires is for the industry to agree mm. that they will run separate accounts. Mm. Right. Right. And therefore, they cannot do this bundling and mixing of the odds. They'll have to reveal truly if you pay 100. Yeah. How much of it is going into the access fee mm. and how much of it is really bet money? Mm. Right? Well, these were the proposals that you yeah. had actually uh, sent to the GOM. Uh, yeah. And of course, now we know that the decision of the GST Council, which according to the Revenue Secretary is not a decision at all. It's a reiteration of what the, in his words, what the law is. Mm. The Revenue Secretary in his conversation with me says that there is no question of retrospectivity because this 28% on full value is the situation as of today. And in fact, they believe that they, you know, the... Uh, high Court judgment of the Karnataka High Court will be challenged now by the Revenue Department to say this is established law and this is the rate on full value. So given that, what do you expect this meeting of the GST Council on the 2nd of August to arrive at? And this is also unusual because it's a meeting of the GST Council after a decision has ostensibly been taken to operationalize a decision which hasn't happened previously. Look, I, I, it's no secret that I've been less than a great fan of the way the GST Council operates. But I have a lot of profound issues. Uh, as you may know, the first meeting I attended, I listed them because that was the first time a DMK uh, minister had been a member. It was like three years into the life of the council. But in practice, these are the nuances that really bother me, right? Like once a decision, of, so this, G, if, if it is reiteration of the law, why did we need the GOM? Mm. If the first GOM report was acceptable, why was it sent back? Now the second GOM report has arrived at the same conclusion that according to the government is the law. Mm. Right? Now they have one more meeting just for the sake of implementation. Right? I mean at some level I'm okay that the GST council meets, but at some other level, what is the basis for the meeting, how the agenda gets set? For example, in 2022 we had an emergency meeting or 2000, yeah, 2020, 21 December. Mm. We had an emergency meeting on December 31st with like 24 or 48 hours notice, again unprecedented, mm. for a single point issue of deciding to put on hold the GST Council's decision to raise uh, the rate on some kinds of textiles. Yeah. Right? I mean, then what's the point of having the council? What's the point of making the decision? So a lot of these things are very haphazard. They're not mm. run 
you know, with enough, in my mind, with enough uh, uh, foreplanning and thought. Hmm. And then you end up with kind of, uh, you know, political pressure comes one way, you do hmm. something, it comes another way, you hmm. do another thing. And, it, it, you know, I realize it's, a, it's in its infancy, right? Hmm. It's a 75-year-old country. Hmm. Council's been around for five years, yep. now six years. It's not like it's got a long track record. There'll be teething trouble. But there are some profound issues that need to be addressed, in my opinion, mm. about how the agenda gets set, how mm. the topics are decided, how the decisions are kind of ratified without having to look back. Mm. Right? For example, compensation. Mm. Everybody asked for compensation. And there was kind of discussion about it. There was no decision. Now, the question is, who should decide whether compensation should they, uh, continue or not? Mm. Is if it's the council, it mm. should have been brought to the council agenda, agenda item and put to vote. Mm. If it's not the council, how is it federalism and how is this the prime kind of a platform of uh, you know union state relations? Mm. If the compensation issue was not decided by the council, mm. but de facto decided by somebody else, and going back to the same terminology, the constitutional amendment called for five years. Five years are up. Discussion closed. Right. That's it. There was there was no actual process mm. further. So these are the I think issues that over time will have to be worked out for the council to be really an effective mm. kind of body. Right? So you know to to end because you know we will have to see what happens on the second. But uh, you do believe that claims of the industry's demise are somewhat exaggerated. You believe what we could possibly see happening is, uh, you know, the industry moving into dark mode. Uh, and that, once again, has been one of the concerns uh, left on the table. But what do you believe could be the best way forward? And how hard will it be to execute what has already been decided? Look, uh, to execute what has been decided is uh, blunt force, right? I mean, do you have uh, good enough uh, um, firewalls and blockers and, you know, sites from operating and so forth? Is this a technology issue for online gaming? For horse racing casinos, it's much easier, right? You can go physically inspect and make sure. So, uh, is it implementable? The answer is, at least for horse racing and casinos, it's implementable. For online gaming, it's a technology question. Mm. I assume that with the right kind of uh, uh, focus, you can get the right kind of solutions, right? The different countries ban WhatsApp calling. They're, they're able to get away with that. And that's a much more ubiquitous yeah. kind of application. The more profound question is, is this the best outcome for the people and for the industry, meaning for the people, meaning the revenues of the state, mm. the state, all mm. governments together, I mean, you know, for, for the governments and for the uh, industry, and is it protective or somehow value adding to the people? Mm. That to me still remains open, right? Uh, it, it, to my mind, the demise was always the extreme case. Right? Mm. I don't see things demise just because the tax rate is high. But like you have 100 examples all over the world, right? Like when we tax alcohol high, we expect some of it will be that people stop drinking because that they can't afford to pay the tax. When you tax tobacco high, we mm. expect people stop smoking because they can't afford to pay the tax. So there's enough precedent that you should expect that at least it will have a retardant effect on the rate of growth of the industry mm. because of the tax. And at worst, it could drive a lot of this activity into illegal corners of mm. the market or mm. the world that uh, nobody benefits from. Because then what you worry about is second order effects, right? The loss of revenue, all of this is a primary effect. Yeah. The second order effect is once you see criminal activity, meaning by definition, illegal activity right. is criminal activity. Right. Then your criminal activity with large amounts of money involved will lead to all kinds of mm. other complications mm. and law and order mm. problems mm. and so forth. So that's the real risk of having a high tax rate. Eventually, like all the rest of the world, mm. I think the best case solution will be to find a way to get at the common agreement of what is the platform fee or the access fee or the gross mm. gaming revenue. And then 28% on that. Tax that indirectly. Tax mm. that with the equivalent of sales tax. Mm. And tax the winnings with income, income tax. tax as direct tax. That's what most countries in the world do, actually, right? That, I think, would have been the right answer, but it requires a level of technology and it re requires a level of implementation that maybe some people feel is not realistic. I can't tell. In, you know, were it up to me, based on my global mm. experience, I would say, if other people have done it, we should be able to do it. Mm. And the industry needs to cooperate. They have to say, what is the percentage and they have to show, like by having separate accounts, yeah. that they're actually adhering to that percentage. Because if the percentage is wrong, in two years or five years or six months, you'll find that money is accruing in the mm. pot. 
hmm. in the in the escrow pot without being distributed, hmm. right? If if they if, they, if they do the division yeah. wrong, yeah. you'll find if, if they do the division the other way wrong, you'll find that they're not able to pay winnings, hmm. right? So over time, there'll be an accumulation that tells you what's right and what's wrong. Okay. So you're saying uh, essentially the best way would be for the for revenue to actually tax 28% at gross gaming. Uh, but you're also saying that industry needs to come clean on what constitutes gross gaming revenue and arrive at a uniform uh, definition of what constitutes gross gaming revenue. And that is what, at least as far as, as online real money games are concerned, the 28% should be levied on gross gaming revenues. Yeah, I think that would work really well for online. It would work really well for horse racing. Okay. Whether that would work well for casinos or not, I'm not sure because, you know, the member from Goa had all these uh, scenarios where you're talking about people moving tables, winning, losing. You know. I still say that as long as you tax them on the day they come in and, you know, uh, like let's say they come play for eight hours, 50 yeah. games. It doesn't matter. What they came in with, what they go out with is what you should really uh, kind of track. And if you, if you start at inception with parallel right. accounts, you've got a solution in my mind. But maybe that's not implementable in the casinos. I don't know. Well, we will have to wait to see yeah. finally what is operationalized by the GST Council when it meets on the 2nd of August. But uh, thank you very much, Mr. Tyagrajan, for joining us and for taking us through the deliberations that took place within the GOM. Uh, you were part of both the group of ministers meeting. Remember, uh, the last GOM meeting left matters inconclusive and said that it would be up to the GST Council to decide. And the GST Council then, uh, in the words of the Revenue Secretary, merely reiterated uh, an existing decision, which is to tax at 28 percent on full value. Let's see what comes uh, at the end of the August 2nd meeting of the council. Always a pleasure. Appreciate your time.